All right, thank you for staying with us. My name is Dakpo Banjo, and um, this is Crossfire. And I have two gentlemen who joined us in the course of that break. There are no other uh, but um, this very deep, erudite gentleman who studies the nation. They just know, you know, it is really what, you know, um, looking at situations and, and then, you know, looking at it vis-a-vis -vis, um, what people are saying, what government is doing. And uh, we have them on the show, and they will uh, definitely be part of our conversation today. And as usual, you could always participate or call into the show and let us know exactly um, if you differ in opinion. That's what Crossfire is all about. It's our, it's our show. It's your show. And um, that will be very, um, very interesting if you can be a part of the show. I have a political analyst um, in this gentleman and a social commentator. He's not that person, but being on it, Good to have you on Crossfire this morning. All right, and I have the general himself. And um, when we say general, it's not that he's been enrolled in the army before and he's retired. Uh, <laughs> he's just someone who, you know, who it's a general commentator. He just have one good thing to say about one situation, you know, because he's uh, very close to the ground. I, I, I think he's got the ace up his sleeves. Let's meet uh, Dick Bawalayoko. Yeah, good to have you on the Good morning. Just good morning. I don't think it's too early to say happy Independence Anniversary. I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> not, not, not even you know, not even when we have uh, you know, uh, um, we have planned to really start discussing about the independence ahead of time. It's in two days' time, and seriously, I'm beginning to wonder if Nigeria, um, if we should celebrate. I remember there was a time. I can't. I think it was when we were 55. And I think that was during Jonathan's time. It was a very colorful celebration that we had. We had the green, white, green flags almost everywhere across all states of the Federation. I think it was an instruction given at the National Executive Council meeting saying, let's celebrate it. So people, I mean, there were everywhere. flags everywhere and, and all of that. Anyway, um, I haven't seen anything close to that um, happening in preparation towards this independence. And the federal government is even really uh, pretty quiet about the celebration too. Let's see how eventually it pans out. Anyway, uh, we have a conversation around whether we should celebrate or not uh, today. But uh, gentlemen, let me quickly take your comments on some of the stories making headlines. And um, what, what do you, what's your take? You know, having, you know, um, uh, we've been having a very serious discussion about devolutions of power. We've been talking about restructuring the country. Um, a lot of school of thought are of the opinion that when there is good governance, maybe there is no need for restructuring. Maybe there is no need to even devote power, you know, to states and local governments. But as a matter of fact, um, at the National Executive Council yesterday, um, there was a motion to say in, and over all the uh, federal roads to us. And um, hopefully, maybe the states feel or think that they have the resources to be able to um, take over all federal roads you know, across all the 36 states of the federation, including the federal um, you know, capital territory. So what's your take? Do you think the federal roads should be handed over to state governments? And, and, and if you think so, why? Well, I will start with a, a bit of stats for us to understand, um, for people to be able to understand better. Uh, the FARC allocation, when they share the money, they share, federal government has about, I think about 53%, the states has about 27%, when you have the local government having about 21 or 22%. But when you now check the, to uh, the total number of kilometers of roads that we have in Nigeria, close to 66% of them are local roads, owned by, controlled by local governments. And you have maybe another uh, 25 or 27 by states, then federal uh, takes the lowest amount. Mm. Tally that with the way allocations are it, shared. It, yeah. How does it add up in terms of, that's why you have so many terrible roads all over Nigeria. The bulk of the roads when that... we say terrible roads, well, well, federal roads, state roads? All the roads. All there, the roads. Is, there, is no, there is no basis for... Uh, most of the roads in Nigeria are not motorable. Mm. Even if you have a road that is tired, it's not well... Uh, they're very undulating roads. And you hear all sorts of things happen on our roads. So the, the thing is this. The road, for the governors that are clamoring for those roads to be ceded to them, is part of the things that when people start talking about 
our structure of governance. And you start hearing things about restructuring, devolution of power. Those are some of the challenges here. That somebody will sit down in Abuja, will be the one that will determine how you fix a particular road in a state on how much of resources. Remember what happened with the Lagos to... Airport Road? A Airport Road, yeah. The Lagos State Government said they have resources down to fix the road. And there was a running battle between him and his former predecessor in Lagos State, who yeah. is now the Minister of Works, Power and Housing. And you know what went on for a while before, I think, the uh, former... So, let, let, let's give it as a 50th birthday, um, you know, um, a gift no, to no, Lagos no. State. And... No, no, the, the thing is this. Our issues have not been addressed systemically. Okay. And that is where we are, where we are, because of the, the form of unitary government that we run. Mm -hmm. uh, we keep kidding ourselves that we're running a true federalism where you're still running a pseudo-democracy. It's more like something that was imported from the military. So mm -hmm. when it comes to these roads, there are some things that you even have on the exhausted, li exhausted, exhausted lifts where the federal government seems to control a whole lot of things, like state police, uh, the issue of police, police yeah. as well, the issue of uh, resources. You hear the state owns the land, but the resources under the ground are owned by the federal government. Yeah. So quite a lot of anomalies, which yeah. I believe federal government is going beyond. Uh, the nations have advanced. We have evolved. You have gone beyond your bar, trying to control every single thing in the economy. When you start hearing things like, for example, the government is going to create jobs, that's not the responsibility of government. What you need to do is to enact laws, policies that will create the ease for businesses to thrive or things to work. Okay. So it's, it's a good one by the state pushing for that, but I'm looking at it more from for other critical issues in the economy. I think we need to start addressing that. How certain things should be ceded to the states okay. and local governments to control so that you can have governance come directly to the people. All right, what's your take, um, General? Yeah, yeah it, it's a... Good development, so to speak. Because, uh, like uh, Gwenga said, you cannot imagine someone sitting in Abuja and then telling us that he or she knows the condition of the road in uh, Ogumaki, one small village in Ogun State. <laughs> he might not even have any reason to get there before he leaves office. Gone were the days when we had what they call the Director of Engineering in all the states, I mean, Federal Military of Works had uh, what they call Director of Engineering that supervises the roads that belong to the federal government. You know, the issue of roads is a, is a creation of the you know, Constitution that says that all roads linking one village to the other, one town to the other, belong to the federal government. So it's not that the federal government just woke up one day and said, I'm going to take over your road. If the states are clamoring for these things to be given to them, all well and good. But the point is, are they good? This is very, it's going to be a very long and tortuous journey yeah. because it involves some constitutional amendments. Yeah. It involves toying with the revenue allocation. Allocations. Because is it with the 26% or whatever, or 24 <laughs> that they are collecting, which which they, could not, they cannot even pay salaries that they will be doing roads. They probably we have some to, states. To, we have to, some states to, that to, are, to deploy some parts of their internally generated revenues. And this, they, they couldn't deploy this IGR to go and pay salaries. Many of them are owing 12, 13, 14, 22 more salary. Mentally lazy. People. You see, it is not because at a time when you sit down, you say it's not because the government is far. It is because of the people in government. My pastor told me a story that about six, seven years ago, that they went to a village in the old Midwest that is now under Delta State. I can't remember the name of the village. That when they got there, they met some very old people. And the old man was recounting with nostalgia that that road that these people you followed to get to my village was constructed by Baba Femi Awolowo when he was the premier of Western Region, when Midwest was under Western Region. Then you imagine Baba was in Badon. How was he able to go to Ogara, or yes, Ogara, to go and construct a road there? Some years back, I had my son who was at uh, May, May, Mayflower College, Ekene, and I had cost to go there. They were telling me that these roads were constructed by Baba Femi Awolowo, still solid road as at that time. So it is not a matter of the distance, it is a matter of the person involved. Let us give it to them, no problem, the states. Let's hope, we'll give them one allocation because we need to think about the allocation. It is not with their 26% that they will be able to fix roads. They have to also think about, because even those who did federal government roads, said 10, 15 years ago, 
federal government has not paid them. You know there are some time in Southwest. Some, local, some state government said, okay, we can't open our eyes and allow these roads to be like this. Okay, we are going to construct federal government roads. Many of them are still asking for this money. So it's a whole lot of so many things. Yes, the concern is there. Yet we have the issue of revenue and allocation. allocation. But the point is the people that are going to manage it, mm. are they sincere? All right. I mean, well, well, well thought out um, comments uh, and all of that. Now, I, I mean, there's this very mind boggling, you know, um, story, you know, making headlines. And that is the discussion between the health workers and uh, federal government still handed in a, in, a, in a deadlock. Unfortunately, I have lost an uncle who fell ill um, in Ibadan. And um, it, it was, I mean, the son attempted and uh, prepared and they brought him to Lagos hoping that, okay, we can supervise, you know, his health and, 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 and all of that. He was actually um, admitted into a hospital in Ibadan, but because he wasn't getting, you know, the attention needed, he was eventually brought to Lagos. But, I mean, the, the story has changed. He's dead. Uh, and, you know, October has been slated. October 2nd, Monday has been, you know, projected you know, for his 80th birthday. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, preparation has gone towards that and stopped. But here we have a situation. Do you think if health workers strike in London, are we not going to have a dead president by now? And I'm wondering why, I mean, we still have a deadlock where uh, the health minister and the minister for labor and employment is still saying you have flaunted some labor laws instead of really looking at the request of the labor, I mean, of the medical workers and, and telling them, okay, this is where we stand and this, and this is the provision that we're making to get rid of this. Is this not a level of insensitivity, you know, or probably irresponsibility on the part of, you know, people that we have trusted, you know, this, this nation um, to? Well, you know, the, the last that was the last time I was here. Maybe two, two, two time, the, the last time I was here, I was mentioning something about what exactly is governance about. Mm. How do you measure governance? What's the focus of a government when it comes to governance? And I mentioned three key things: health, education, and security. security. Every other thing will revolve when we around them. Um, they call something Human Developmental Index. That is how you measure the growth of an economy. Mm -hmm. That's how you measure whether the, the government is performing or not. And when you look at all these three things, it revolves around the people. It's about the living conditions of the people. It's about the quality of lives of the people. So when you see these kind of things happening, what you begin to understand is that the people that are the government side addressing these issues Mm. are not focusing on the people. They are not focusing on, they see themselves more as emperors. Yeah, but would this include the health workers? No, no, no. Who are the, who are the expense of people's lives? No, no, no. Uh, that still, for, that still that for, the strike? thing is this. If you read a report about a week ago, they said about 2,500 doctors will be living to the United, United Kingdom and other places. Do you know why this agitation has kept on? For I have a lot of friends that are doctors. Renumeration, you don't deal with that. Training, you don't deal with that. Hazard-related items, you don't deal with that. Even Medical the resources, the, infra yes. the most of them are even living because of infrastructures. Mm. If you look at the NHS in the United Kingdom, most of the doctors there are Nigerians. Nigerians are the ones that are keeping NHS running in the United Kingdom. And you know why most are exiting? It's because of the working conditions, which means you have the, the, the infrastructure all it takes for you to carry out your responsibility. So some people will say we'll make our big doctors. I beg to differ. If we are making our big doctors, they will not be sought for from all, all over the world. Oh, wow. But the thing is this, a nation that does not focus and does not see those things as a threat to their survival mm. and proactive enough to do all it takes to resolve that issue, that nation or that leadership is insensitive, is not focused on the interests of the people. Because at the end of the day, the doctors will go to the same market you are going to. All right. They have bills they to pay. They live in the same houses. They like live in the same people. houses. They are the same human beings like us. So if you are not creating the enablement, you are not doing what it takes for them to, or rather you are arguing over whether they have violated labor law or they have not violated labor law, government must be, how would I put it, you must show some good faith. Good faith. Government also must be responsive 
are not always be combative. And, Ma and maybe they're not thinking that the uh, and we're not really really thinking that the health workers are asking for something completely you know out of the blue. Who should earn something... more out of the health sectors and those that are in teaching career than all these politicians? Who should earn more? Who should earn more? Who is adding more value to life than the people who are, that will sustain with a commonwealth? It takes somebody not, who is alive anyway to go to school. I mean, so 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 so, so the thing is about priority. Yeah. Who should we focus on? Who should we improve their living condition? Because without quality health, without quality education, no nation can move forward. All right, um, General, you have a quick comment to to add to that, so that we can go into um, our major conversation for today. Yes, uh, you have to pardon me again for having to make reference to the past, because <laughs> the glorious days are in the past in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, some people told us while we were growing up that when Babile Tawaf was the premier of Western Region, that no worker went on strike just for one day. No worker. Mm. Maybe I should repeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that, that no for single the sake worker, of people, people who didn't hear, mm -hmm. that when Baba Femiolo was the premier of Western Region, I think he was premier for about six, seven years, that no worker went on strike for, even for a single day. At times, you ask yourself, when you hear stories or reports that workers gave what they call ultimatum of 21 days, which is what the labor law says. After the expiration of 21 days, there's another additional seven days. And at the end of the day, they will still go on strike. Then the question you ask yourself is, what, what, what happens to the communication line? You know what government does? If you give them ultimatum, uh, ultimatum of the first 21 days, they will relax, they won't say anything, which is what the labor law says. Then the second seven days, maybe two days to the expiration of the 13 days, <laughs> they contact the mayor, you know. Mm -hmm. This is because the labor law also says that when negotiation is on, everybody should maintain status quo. That is, no worker should go on strike, no employer should sack anybody. Mm. It is provocative, honestly. The question you ask yourself, why did you wait for about 27, 28 days? before we now wake up to now contact the union. That so it is very, very unfortunate. <sighs> but I, unfortunately, the work, uh, you see, when the issue of strike comes up, I always tell people that I'm a very wrong person to be asked that question. Because when I finished university, unfortunately for me, I'm very, used to, very sorry to use the word, I came into this profession of journalism, where we don't know anything about strike, <laughs> unfortunately. So anytime I hear strike, I always become combative. I look at it from perspective of maybe these guys are insensitive. But if you want to cross to the other side, you look at what these guys are passing through. Yes, they are better than other people anyway, but they have other things to compare themselves with. Minga has just told us about what is happening in London. About uh, 10, 15 years ago, you notice that there was a time that almost 50% of doctors and 50% of health workers took a flight from Nigeria. Many of them went to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I have some of them that are still in London today, still and they have people, become yeah. big, big, big people. Many of our friends whose wives were, were nurses got located to London. Before you know it, they have moved with their family, their husbands, and their, their children. So, and we have not learned a lesson. That is why some of us are worried. And we, cannot learn, we can't learn, learn a lesson. This is because the people that are ruling us, let me use the language of a friend who always calls into radio. He said they are ruling us. Even if they have headache, they go abroad. Yeah. They don't patronize hospitals here. Yeah. So whether you, the doctors go on strike for it in their kingdom, it doesn't concern them. Even mm. their children don't patronize hospitals here. Mm. So it is very, very unfortunate that we find ourselves in this situation. I sympathize with the workers. But unfortunately, you know, we did, have not read the story that we only read the headline that the oh, government is talking about you have planted the law. There must have been some discussions. I am very much aware that they have been discussing. Have been discussing yeah. But it's only that they have not really found a common ground. But you know, journalists will always pick on something to make us the headlines, <laughs> and people will, and before you know it, you will think that government has not been discussing. But I think it All is right. very necessary for government to become more sensitive. Yes, they don't patronize hospitals here. They should think about some of us that don't have the presidential muzzle to go abroad for medical visits. They should have think of us. Because, right. because at times when you listen yeah. to television or watch television or radio, it has become monotonous and very disturbing. You will see people asking for money. Somebody needs operation in India, 8 million naira. Somebody's uh, daughter needs an operation in something, 3 million naira. It, it's very appalling. And these politicians that throw money around, they won't see that. To say, oh, somebody, okay, let, but when it comes to election, they can spend trillions. But they can also afford treatment abroad. 
is very, very important. All right. Um, thanks for, for, for those thoughts. I mean, we, we, we have a situation. Let's quickly introduce this before we go on a commercial break. We have a country that is bound, you know, to the, to the west by, by, by the Bini Kingdom. We have um, a country, you know, called Nigeria that is bound, you know, to the... Um, to the Gulf of the Guinea, you know, coming to the south, we have a country that is so large that towards the north we have the Chad Republic, we have Niger, and then you know, then then to the to the east we probably have a country you know that is bounded by the you know the Republic of Cameroon. Now that that is a big country. Nigeria got independence in 1960 when a lot of agitations. I mean, I mean, with credit to channels, I was listening to. A, a very short caption of a statement made by, um, 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 in, I mean, Inamdi Azikwe, saying that we agitated for independence and we got it from, you know, um, we got it from British, I mean, from, from Britain. Uh, but the truth is that he said, I am not particular about who is coming from the north to come and become the prime minister of this country. I am not moved if it is the uh, Sautana of Sokoto or whoever the North is, is bringing. I am not moved by Chivoba Femi Alolo or coming from the West to be the prime minister, nor myself. What I am interested in is a free country. And that was a very great statement coming from that great man who, who, who led us at one point in time. Now, Nigeria became a republic. <laughs> what is a republic? A people coming together with one ideology, saying mm -hmm. we, can we, can, we, can, we can elect our leaders and we will trust their, you know, their decision. Now, my question before we go on this leave is this. Are we really sure? Do you believe in a nation? Do you believe in a nation that, that believes in the ideology of a group of people that has been selected as our representative, either elected or selected as our representative, taking a decision or taking decisions on our behalf, or you believe in the collectivity of the people of that nation actually having a say in whatever they believe. Anyway, 57th anniversary of Nigeria. Do we have anything to celebrate? Becomes the question. We'll go on this short break, and when we come back, we'll be having a conversation about this. We'll be right back after now. Stay with us. All right, good to be back. And um, we, before we went on that break, we definitely introduced our conversation today. And we'll be looking at Nigeria at 57. What celebrating or not? And if we have to celebrate, what exactly do we celebrate? Now, a lot of people are of the opinion that we have a lot of things to celebrate. Some other school of thought are of the opinion that we should not celebrate anything because this country has not moved forward. We don't even have any reason to want to celebrate. And um, if there is a need to celebrate, government should tell us why, I mean, what and what and what and what and what, you know, to celebrate. Like a friend told me yesterday, he said, if you are 57 years old and you are in a confused state as Nigeria is, do you think you should mark your 57th year birthday I, and, I, and I answered very hypothetically by saying that the fact that I'm still alive may, may just be worth celebrating. Maybe I don't have a house, I don't have a job, I don't have so many things. I, I, I mean, the, the fact that I'm alive, I possibly or probably have a reason to celebrate, hoping that by the time I'm 60, maybe something would have changed or something would have, <laughs> something would break. I have these gent two gentlemen in, in the studio, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to trust them to, to pr probably be able to encourage you to celebrate on Sunday into Monday, or just try as much as possible to take enough rest and pray very well and hard fasting <laughs> to it, you know, <laughs> between Sunday and Monday. By the end of the show, you probably go on this journey with me, and then we will decide at the end of the show if we have a reason to celebrate. Gentlemen, economy. Education, leadership, policy, infrastructure, industrialization, youth empowerment. Um, I mean, yesterday, a, a governor, you know, in the, in the southwest of Nigeria was saying that 
Primarily, he believed that industrialization and youth empowerment is the, is the, is the way out of Nigerian problems. And uh, some other people have been saying some really, really, um, you know, interesting thing, uh, and, and I'm wondering. But for the, for the sake of this conversation, I'm throwing it back, you know, to you guys. Let's look at it. What is the ideology, or well, what ideology do you believe in? A selected people, either elected by a, a, a normal process or selected by a means of just saying we trust them or we believe in what they have to be able to lead us. Or you believe in a nation where everybody participates in the process of deciding who we are, what we have, or what we are, you know, in moving us forward. What, what, which of these two ideologies do you, do you actually support? Well, I, so I subscribe to the ideology where governance is all inclusive, okay. um, where people have a say in their coexistence, in um, they have a say in the structure of governance, they have a say in how policies are molded. Okay. What we have presently in Nigeria is a complete aberration from that. It's a system that is um, that's um, skimmed the people that are supposed to be the the beneficiaries of everything a government does. It has skimmed them out of the whole system. You talked about voting people into power. Uh, they are say we have a fraudulent electoral act, a fraudulent electoral law that will empower those that um, take advantage of the system. The political elites that um, you can imagine somebody getting a form for presidential ambition of about 30 million naira. You need to campaign for election. They are spending billions. And um, you have, and such things will thrive because still the same structure, unitary government that winner takes all, all power is at the center, what we inherited from the, the military. You know, you mentioned something earlier about. Um, is there an ideology behind this country? Yes. I dare say, there is no ideology behind this country. We have not even evolved into nationhood. Because when you see people talk about anything in this nation, it tinkers around ethnicity, it tinkers around religion. And, and that is a position that you have given to me to puncture your argument. Okay. You have a nation that is built around ethnicity, people's, pe the people's interest is not common. It is only... Uh, it is only that. associated and driven by what they want. So, so if we have an encompassing, you know, uh, scenario or an yeah. ideology where the North says, this is what I want, the East, are we not going to be in a more confused state? No, 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 no. When you talk about nationhood at the end of the day, yes. the ideals of people, when it comes to nationhood, what are the ideals of people to be able to have the basic essentials of life, hmm. to be able to have access to basic education. And you think this, this can be decided void of ethnicity? It, uh, all and those things are basic human wants. Okay. It has nothing to do with your race. Okay. It has nothing to do with where you reside. It has nothing to do with your sexuality. Those are basic things that humans need to survive. Okay. And unemployment, for example, in Nigeria, is it race-driven? Mm. Is it region-driven? Health uh, is not health race. Infrastructure issue. Is it race-driven, is it ethnicity-driven, is it religion? So when all the elements that you have mentioned, whether it's policy, whether it's leadership, you have all those things abounding, but in the varying degrees all over Nigeria. Mm. So what people are clamoring for, even the constitution that says uh, the primary responsibility of every government, that be uh, social security and welfare, Nigerians are not asking for so much. Nigerians are not asking for the, to be rich. They are asking to have access to basics. The basics of life are still what we are battling with. Okay. Basics. We don't have access to those basics. When you have over 80% of Nigerians living on less than $2 a day, look at unemployment rates. Okay. Unemployment among the youths. Look at the state. Most of the, like, like you rightly said earlier, most of the infrastructures that we still have existing that you call federal government infrastructure, some of them from colonial days, some of them from the time of our law. Most of the infrastructures you have. So the question you ask yourself, since democracy started, what has every Democrat put on the table? Okay. 
All right, let's take let, let's take your thought, uh, General. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, this, uh, first of all, what's your ideology? As against the Nigerian people, nothing ideology. people centric. <laughs> yes, <laughs> my ideology is about the people. Okay, but do we, as a country, have an ideology? Because there's a national question we have not even identified. Yes. Now we talk of answering it. You see, the issue of uh, Nigeria's uh, age is very controversial <laughs> because Nigeria was born in 1914. That was when Nigeria came into being, and yes, when yeah. the amalgamated of that the is North the amalgamation. Am am so Nigeria got its independence in 1957. So when was Nigeria born? Nigeria is about 57 years anyway. That is very controversial. But the issue is, yes, as an independent nation, do we have anything to celebrate? Is it celebrate or mark? It depends on which one you want. <laughs> Yes, we can mark it, we can celebrate it. But do we call for a party, like I'm a Yoruba, you call who and be, you know, so everyone want to mark their birthday, they invite Sonny or Obe, and then some people will mark their birthday quietly in his bedroom or invite a few friends. We have so many things to celebrate. Okay. That we are still one. It's worth celebrating. Are we one? No, I mean, we are, as we, that we are still a country <laughs> called Nigeria. That there's, a country, I mean, yeah. that there's a country called Nigeria. Nigeria. Because if you know what we have gone through after the three-year bitter civil war, Nigeria came back as a country. After the June 12 crisis, Nigeria came back as a country. Before the 2015 election, mm. in fact, many people felt after the election we were going to break apart. Many Nigerians who operate at the ports, because that's where I operate. Stopped importation, because they said they don't want to put their money, they don't know what to happen after the election. But the point is, has Nigeria met the expectations of its people, the Africans, the black people, and the world? Their capital, the answer is capital, no. We have improved in so many ways, in almost everything. In infrastructure, to some extent, health, Economy. I remember that when Jagari was there, the budget was 250 million pound naira. Now we have 7 trillion naira. But unfortunately, as we are improving and growing in other areas, the most important, the most important thing, which is the standard of living of people, has not improved. That is the irony of Nigeria. Okay. Everything has improved. Economy, everything, infrastructure, airport. At least almost all the state capital have airports now. But the living standard of people, interestingly, has been deteriorating. At times, when I look at some of our children these days, and I remember I, when we were even growing up, even in secondary school, I remember when I, Yakub Gawon was still the head of state. Uh, we were always looking forward to October 1st because we know they were going to give us free rice in school. Mm. They will give us uh, this cup, and everybody flag will be dancing. But all those ones, even the children that have not even gone to, who have been able to eat, will now be eating on the 1st of October. You see, but unfortunately, you look at the quality of the leadership. That is the greatest problem we have. The leaders of the 57, 58, 60 that got independence for us, then you compare them to the leadership that we have today, you will know that we have even decreased in that area. Mm. Because yes, they have their follies. They had their inadequacies. But there's no way you can compare them with the present crop of leadership we have today. That is another area we have, where we have deteriorated. And that is why. But, but, but I like to interject there. So where, where, what, what, really, what really started our problem? If you compare the leadership, the set of people we had who were leaders at that time, talk about the Enam Diazikwe of, this, of Nigeria, Obafemi Awolowo of Nigeria, Tafabalewa of Nigeria. And we had these people because when we started as a republic, we have just the North, the West, and the East. And we had these three um, gentlemen sitting and presiding over the affairs. So is the problem today leadership or structure? You see, because that time it was a region, it was a regional uh, or a regionalized country that we that we're talking about here. But today it's a different ball game. It is a so are we blaming it on the quality of leaders we had that time, or we are talking about structure? You are bringing in another thing, which I don't always want to engage in: the issue of restructuring. You see, the point is, <laughs> when those people were there, yes. how did they emerge? They emerged out of a struggle. Perhaps that was what prepared them for the role they played eventually. Like I always say, they always have their follies and inadequacies. But these are the people who were struggling for something. But the present crop of leaders, what did they struggle for? 
it, it, the, many of them got it that it dropped on their laps. Apart from one or few of them that mm. were involved in the agitation to get the military out, majority of the people in government today have got there because Nigerians, Nigerians deliberately wanted democracy and we produced them. It's not because as a result of a genuine struggle. Mm. Yeah, the Baba Femina the Inam Diazikwe, the Baba Balewa or Sultan. Where, are, where were they coming from? You look at the antecedents. You look at what they engaged in. They were lo the three of them were looking for something. How do we get ourselves out of colonialism? And at least call something that belongs to us. Yes, they have amalgamated North and South, but they have their differences. But they were looking for, okay, how do we become what we call have self-rule? But the leaders of today, what brought them together? It is how do we share the Commonwealth? That is the difference between those two. Mm. It is not that those guys were saints. I'm not saying they are saints. You can still see many of some of them are not poor, except maybe the then prime, prime, uh, prime minister of Nigeria that was pictured sitting down on the mat with some small, small children, if I say prime minister. But many of these people lived good lives. But you cannot compare them with these people. Because the present crop of leadership that we have, they are the crop of leadership that change their, their, their nomenclature mm. from uniform to Akwada. That's why there was a cartoon about three years ago where somebody was asking, who is your president? He showed the president that was wearing an army uniform but put Akwada on top of it with a cap. But that is the Nigerian politician. Yes, yeah, that was the question. He said, who is the Nigerian politician? He drew, he gave up a picture of somebody wearing a full general with a quarter and a cap. <laughs> Be because the thinking of these people is not different from the military men. Yeah. At whatever level, at other chairman, local government, um, governor of a state, they reason and think like, like a military Paris. man. Because they graduated from the military regime. So it wasn't that they went through any tutelage that would break them a politician. Mm -hmm. And that is why we continue to ring my role. That is why we will continue to be in the same state. It is very, very unfortunate that Nigerians have failed these people. Because I, I, if somebody had told me about 20, 30 years ago that this is what Nigeria would be compared to where we are coming mm. from, okay. I would have said no. All but right. like I said, we have to... We have, we all, are, all right, gentlemen, I have a question for us. I mean, to, so that people at home can follow us. What is keeping us together as a nation? <laughs> why, why are we still here. We complain so much about leadership, we complain so much about a lot of things that we don't have and that we have failed to do over the years. Nigeria has failed to really evolve. We have seen a lot of other nations of the world who went through the same, I mean, process that we went through, got, I mean, were colonized, got uh, uh, liberated or got uh, um, free uh, or got independence and, and all of that. We, we, we had them really getting involved as nations today. One of those countries is the United States of America. One of those countries is India. I was reading the report of how India actually evolved. He, he, India actually went through a, a couple of things that Nigeria is trying to go through now, and it still survived. They had a problem when Pakistan actually seceded and they left. When they went, I, I realized that what India did was that they went into a referendum. People said, okay, going forward, this is the way we want to be governed. This is exactly how we want, but see how India has, has succeeded, see how India has moved forward. Today, I mean, a, a, a couple of my friends, the last time I had an opportunity to travel, and they were telling me, all, almost four of them, I was talking to them, Indians were their bosses in their various, you know, endeavors, you know, in the, in the United States of America. And, and I'm wondering, these people have moved forward, they have, they have grown, they have evolved, and there is progress. Now, what is the fabric? What is it that is holding this country together? The elites come out to agitate and we tell them, you are the people who spoil us. But the people talk, but they do nothing to really, you know, get, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a question I would still want to ask, really. But my, my question right now is that, what is really you know. keeping this country together? Why are we still here? Corruption. <laughs> oh, corruption. Okay. Corruption and sharing. Those are the things all the Gentlemen, do you get shares? <laughs> no, 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 no. Do, do you? No, no, what no, you I'm, said, I'm asking, it says yes. something. I want to bring it from what it says. Is that why you have not, uh, no. I mean, been fighting? You have not gone to. That is why they you? have the emperors, the guys in the military regalia, they also have <laughs> the, Agbada. the Agbada on it, but they have the mentality of the military. That is what is keeping them together. That is what they are sitting on. I told somebody, somebody called on the radio station once. Mr. Nitilo, why don't you go and campaign and be this? I said, 
Let me tell you, if I get there, mm -hmm. I will fail. Yes. The system that we run is designed to make good men fail. Mm -hmm. That's the system that we have. No matter how good you are, with the unitary kind of government, you can imagine the Lagos State governor sitting like a uh, kidnappers are running around in his terrain, kidnapping people, schools, but he can't do anything about it. And they call him the chief security officer of the state. He's financing an arrest, doing everything, but the commissioner of police does not accountable to him. The military guys in that state, they are not accountable to him. Even the DSS director is not accountable to him. They must take instructions from Abuja. And the governor sits, and everybody comes after the governor. You are not doing this, you are not doing that. Mm -hmm. What do you call that kind of a nation? If it's not a nation that is... When we talk about corruption most of the time, it's always about money, 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 money. But something... Even the processes are, are, are corrupt. We, every, or they are given back to in a corrupt... The uh, system a, is designed... To, to, to fight against anything that is good, that wants to work in the interest of the people. And it started, he mentioned about the Awolowo, Azikwe. If they inherited this kind of constitution, I can bet you there is no much they can do. It's the system. The system is what defines the kind of leadership that you have. The system that you run. This is structure, system of governor. That is what, why do you think... Donald Trump today is still being checkmated from doing a lot of things in the United States. The system. All right. It's a system. It's more powerful than even the president of the United States. All right, America. General, because of time, we have just about a minute more on the show. I mean, I'm yes, surprised. I, 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 at times, yes, I know. ask myself, what is keeping us together? Yes. I don't, at times. <laughs> because, you see, at that level of mm. leadership, mm. those guys don't think of ethnicity. <laughs> they don't think about Aousa Ibo Yoruba. It's only when they fall out among themselves, they come back to us and begin to appeal to some sentiments. At their level, they are united, no Yoruba, no Ibo, no Aousa. At our own level, let me give you an example. In my office today, mm. my colleagues in the office, 95% of them are Ibo. And I repeat, 95% of my colleagues are Ibo. I see the way these guys take me, the small, small ones. You know, when Ibo want to greet you, if I'm an elderly person, and they stretch out their hand, God bless you. Mm. This, I, I feel very happy. In the afternoon, when we want to take our lunch at our level, we all buy food into one big, um, what do you call it, cooler. And everybody goes there, you pick your own, all of them Igbo. The guys who buy this food for us, interestingly, are our Megad, the Aousa, Malam. You can see how we coexist. There is a girl that sells Agbo, a Yoruba girl. If this girl comes in the evening and she sits down in the, among these Igbo guys, <laughs> you will know the difference. All right. So that is, what, that is exactly what is keeping us together. At the level over there, they unite. No, you don't know your water. Okay. At our own level here, we unite. No, you don't know your water. I think that is the only thing that is keeping All right. Us. This is a conversation for another day. To enjoy more of this, our Ugonke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.